Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm in the business of misery and business is doing good. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Misery, which came out in 1990 with a screenplay by William Goldman, based on the novel by Stephen King and directed and produced by Rob Reiner. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Paul Sheldon, played by James Caan. Paul has just finished off his new novel and is on his way to deliver it to his publicist when he's involved in a car accident in a blizzard. He's saved by Annie Wilkes and he's cared for in her home. But it turns out that Annie Wilkes, played by Kathy Bates, is his number one fan and has no intention of letting him go. So Stephen King was actually reluctant, apparently, to sell the movie rights to Misery. Right. Um, and that's mainly because I imagine that Misery is, it's kind of a reflection of Stephen King. Like, yeah. I mean, Stephen King puts a lot of writers in his movies guess, and yeah, stories. Yeah. <clears throat> and we all know, it's, it's no secret anymore, that Stephen King had a serious substance abuse problem. <laughs> yeah, if you ever watch Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> And uh, and so there's a lot of Stephen King in in the story. Yes, um, you know Annie Wilkes is the personification of drug abuse. Ah, um, and so that that is how he kind of you know put put what was happening to him in real life in his book. Ah, and so it was very right. personal to him. Yeah. and it took Stephen King many many years later before he actually acknowledged and admitted that that was what he had done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but of course, Stephen King, you know, the, we'd already had at this point Stand by Me. Yeah. Pet Cemetery, yeah. The Shining, yeah. and, and several others. And so I was like, well, it's, it surprises me that Stephen King was, would be reluctant to sell the movie rights regardless. Some um, of them weren't getting the hits like his books were. Well, this is true. I mean, like, well, with The Shining, you know, Stephen King was, is famously very unhappy with it. Yeah. And it was interesting that they offered Jack Nicholson the lead role in Misery, the movie. Ah, and right. he was just like, look, nope. what happened with Shining? I'm not taking that. Yeah, but <laughs> why? Shining's amazing. And so Stephen King literally said to the studios, like, I'm not going to sell you the misery rights unless Rob Reiner directs and produces this movie yeah. after what he did with Stand By Me. Because Stand By Me is amazing. And it also was proof then that Stephen King could branch out away from horror. Yes. Um, because Stephen King was like, I hate being typecast as horror guy. I would like to do other stories. Yeah, and yeah, with, yeah. With Stand By Me being a massive success, he was like, this director is the one I would have directing misery. Yeah. And so Rob Reiner was like, well, of course, I'll, I'll do it. And then you know, then the film went into production. Yeah, I, I was sat here. I was sat with my notepad, getting ready to watch this film, and I started to really wonder what is a bad Stephen King adaptation. You know, like we said, like Carrie is really good, Shining is really good. You know, Stand by Me is really good. Uh, you know, okay, you can look at the TV stuff, the Langoliers. You know, the TV adaptation of The Shining. You know, even. Partially, it has some problems, but they're all I find really good adaptations. You know, like if I'm not, like I'm not a big Stephen King book fan, but honestly, I've seen pretty much all of his film <laughs> versions. <laughs> you know, and and I, like I was getting ready to sit down and uh, and watch this, and I I thought back to what it was like. I remember ninety or just after the film had come out, my mum had got a copy of it and watched it. And I think it, this is one of those films where she said to me, like, you need to watch this. You know, like, it was an eye-opener for a lot of people. Exactly, you know, like, not a femme fatale. I wouldn't call any books femme fatale, but like a black widow. Like, she starts off all fine and friendly and, and you know, wanting to be close to God and positive and all that. But then it just snaps. Oh, yeah. You know. She's and a psycho. She is psycho. <laughs> and Kathy Bates... I'd find it hard to say a bad role that Kathy Bates has done. Oh, Kathy Bates is fantastic. She really, really is. Well, she actually won the Academy Award yeah, exactly. uh, for Best Leading Actress uh, in Misery. I always like that bit in About Schmidt when she climbs into the hot tub with Jack Nicholson. Uh oh. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> but James Caan as well. James Caan, Sonny 
from The Godfather, you know, we're talking... This guy has played a lot of bad guys. Yes. You know, he plays a lot of bad guy roles. And I did read in notes that James Caan... You know, they went for a long list of people that they wanted to... <laughs> they approached every leading male actor in Hollywood. Yeah. De Niro, Harrison Ford, Warren Beatty. And they were all just like, eh, no, no we're no. not going to play a role where we're confined into a bed for however many weeks of shooting. Yeah. And to be dominated by, by a woman. <laughs> well, <laughs> fuck you. Because James Caan looks at this role and goes... I want this. It's everything opposite to everything I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, he he always said that like in in his movies, he's usually the uh, the the guy who's moving things ahead. He's yeah. usually the guy who's making things happen. Yeah. Whereas in Misery, he's much more of a reactive yes. character. He has to react to what Annie's doing. Yeah. And so it's a completely different way of of acting for him. Yeah. And apparently, uh, Kathy Bates uh, and Jimmy Can had a few arguments on set. Really? Because Kathy Bates is like a classical stage. Actress yeah, yeah. who likes to rehearse and rehearse yeah, and rehearse yeah, and rehearse. Yeah. And James Cairns just like no rehearsals. Just do it. We don't rehearse. We just do it because then it's natural and it's real. Yeah. And so they, they they kind of had different approaches to the way they wanted to do it, but you know they, they got through this film and made it what it is. Well, that's it. They must have worked together. I mean, we start off with with Paul finishing his book at the Silver Creek Lodge that he goes to every time, you know, and, and we don't know this. At this point, we only find out about the flashback uh, that comes in a few moments that he's been writing this series of misery books for, what, 10 years, you know, and yeah, he's made a load of money from it and he's got a massive fan base and he's really enjoyed it. But this new book, just like what Gary said about how Stephen King wanted to branch out, this is Paul's way of wanting to branch out and try something new. I mean, the book doesn't even have a title. No. You know, and he even says at one point in the movie, like, I don't even know what it's about. I just wrote and completed it. And then he gets everything together. He has his little ceremony of his glass of champagne, his cigarette and his match just laid there really delicately on the side. You know, and he's happy and he gets in his car and he goes. And I look at his car and I'm like, if you're driving in a blizzard in that thing, <laughs> you're asking for fucking trouble. Well, he, he keeps his um, his old trinkets. His, they're his lucky charms. <laughs> they're not very lucky this way. <laughs> no, no, they're not. And it's not long before he barrels off the road. The car flips over and lands in the snow. Yeah. And it's soon buried. And yeah, and you can see him in there. He, he looks pretty banged up. Yeah. And it's not long before you can see the crowbar just scraping at the door to yeah. pry it open. Yeah. And you just see the shadowy figure pick him up, haul him over the shoulder <laughs> yeah. and walk off with him. I'm sorry, if a woman can pick up a grown man in the snow and carry him, you do not want to be locked in a house with her. No. <laughs> But I did like the way that it did flash back after the crash to obviously have us have him talk to his publicist before he goes off for the Silver Lodge, you know, and explain about what he's attempting to do and what he wants to do. And she's positive behind it. So it, it sets up, like you said, that it's not a horror, you know. It, yeah, OK, it's... It's a psychological thriller. It's a psychological thriller, but it, you know, unlike a lot of Stephen King things. Yeah, and it, and it harkens back, like you said, to Rob Reiner with Stand By Me. You know, he did it with Stand By Me where we had a little bit of character, we had a little bit of story character go, and then it flashes back to a bit more of a development for that character. Sure. Well, I mean, this is also, again, a, um, a, a thing with Rob Reiner, who before all of these movies w had made comedies yeah. um, and made dramas, yeah. and he had never made a horror movie before. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of people didn't think that Rob Reiner had it in him to make to make this Stephen King adaptation and so it was a case a case of this you know because he was also an actor he wanted to be a director yeah yeah and you know and he he was tied into like the fan base knows you for what you are so yeah. you keep doing what you do yeah and this this film is all about fandom as yeah. well you yeah. know and Stephen King also saying about how he wanted to break out yeah and and the the lead character in the film also wanting to to break out and do something different yeah uh, uh, but your fans keeping you doing what you do it's it's a case of like the uh, the artist trying to maintain the freedom to create whilst also trying to keep the fan base active because it's like, are you your fans or are the fans yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and all of those things are just really nicely layered in this film. Yeah. I'm your number one fan. There is nothing to worry about. You're going to be just fine. Like he wakes up 
in 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 Kathy Bates's house, you know, in Annie Wilkes's home, and he's confined to the bed, you know, and she's she's telling him that she's his number one fan, you know, and she's giving him painkillers to obviously, and we we follow this over the course of a couple of days, you know, of him just being stuck in this bed. He's been involved in an accident. She she comes across as so kind and caring, yeah. and, sy and sympathetic. <laughs> Fucking you know, Norman Bates, mate. Norman <laughs> Bates. But it's it's so well crafted. Like you, she feels like like the best nurse you could have. Yeah, yeah. You know, she's taking care of you. It just so happens that she is a nurse. That's it. So that no. she can nurse you back to health. I hate that reveal when she pulls down the blankets. Oh, I love that. And reveal. you see his legs are battered and bruised and swollen and disfigured. I that see now that was thing for me, and I I remember this from the first time I've watched this. That, like, I was a fan of horror, you know, and Freddy sticking his gloves into a teen or Jason hitting somebody with a machete. That was nothing. I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Annie Wilkes pulling back those blankets just made everything real. Yeah. Because you're looking at those legs and you, like, I feel it. The pain. I'm like, oh, fuck, shit. Oh, man, he's lucky to be alive. Yeah, and yeah. then partly in my mind, I'm like, I bet he wishes he died in the car. <laughs> you know? Because she explains to him, like, the roads are out. Uh, I can't get an ambulance out here. Phones are down. Phones are down. You know, the only time I can I can actually help you is when I get to, to town. You know, and, and, and Paul's there like, oh man, I need to call my publicist. I need to call my daughter. It's her birthday you know, tomorrow. I love that. That you, like, you never really see his daughter. No. But you, you feel it while you're watching the film. Like, there are people out there who are caring for him and need to know where he is because they, they basically think he's dead. And the... The conversations that Annie and Paul have while they're in that room, while they're in the house, you know, first off, it starts off all sweet and innocent and nice. She's his biggest fan. He's happy for her to help him and, and keep him like this. But then, like, when she comes back with that book, Misery's Child, the, le the last one that he's just released. Yeah. And she walks in and she's like, I picked this up at the store. And he's like, oh, the roads are open. And she's like, ah... Oh, yeah, yeah, but not the one to the hospital, and and you know, and and I called the I called the doctor, and I asked him. I called the head doctor, and I asked him if there was any reason for me to move you to the hospital if I'd done all this, and he told me no. And Paul's like, so the phones are working. Um, no, just the ones in town. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, and you start to go, oh, she's letting things slip. Yeah. You know, she got too excited at the fact that she was about to read a new Paul Sheldon novel yeah. about her favorite character. Yeah. <laughs> and all the while, though, she's still giving him this pain medication. And again, it's another tie in to the whole drug substance abuse thing where in the film, it doesn't sh highlight it too much. But in the book, he then becomes addicted to the pain oh, meds that, that she's giving him. See, I like the way that James can expresses just without saying anything. You know, how he doesn't want to keep taking these pain meds. Yeah. Like, he feels like those are keeping him subdued. Yeah, yes. they're helping with his pain, you know, when, when that comes. But he knows deep down inside that he... he this is this is just going to keep him in bed and he needs to get out. Right. You know, and I love that about James... James can't... Th this, for me, like, I know I've probably seen not as many movies of his that I want to. But this, for me, is one of his best films. Oh, I agree. I agree. You know, because, yeah, those main actors, they had to go up against Kathy Bates. But you can just give so much emotion from just sitting in a bed going, this is really uncomfortable situation. Yes. When my husband left me, I wasn't prepared. It wasn't an easy time. For a while, I thought I might go crazy. I, I want to bring up uh, Richard Farnsworth uh, playing Buster. Um... The, the local sheriff, mayor, fish gamekeeper <laughs> of this tiny little town. I love this guy. Um, if you've ever seen the straight story um, about a guy who travels across America on a, on a tractor to see his brother, it is fucking fabulous. And I totally forgot he was in this. So when I saw him, I'm like, yes, this movie's just gone <laughs> up a few more. I love his snidey, spiteful back and forth with his wife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that actress is fucking brilliant as well. And yeah, they have that like little bit in the car, don't they? Because yeah. he, he gets called, Buster gets called by the publicist and he's just like, oh, okay, I'll go out and I'll investigate. And he goes to the Silver Lodge and he gets told that Paul's like the best guest, you know, and there it's a real shame if anything's happened to him. And so then he's driving along with his wife 
along the stretch of road that Paul's had his accident in. And you see her hand just go onto his knee. And she starts rubbing his leg. And Buster kind of looks and then looks at her. And he's just like, Virginia, when we're in this car, you are my deputy. You are not my wife. And she's like, yes, well, I'd like to be this deputy. would like to be at home with the sheriff under the covers. And I'm like, all right, calm down, people. <laughs> Virginia, when you're in this car, you're not my wife. You're my deputy. This deputy would rather be home under the covers with the sheriff. But it was just really nice to see this this character outside of what we're seeing in the house. You yes. Know? This concerned person wanting yeah. to find evidence of what has happened. Well, he before. sees that damaged tree, doesn't mm, he, where it's yeah. been broken, where the car's flown through it. And, uh, and he, he climbs down through the snow and he falls in and then he gets called away just for you to get that reverse shot there. Yeah, the where wheel. you can just see the tire in the snow and he was just there yeah just there but yeah. his wife called him back <laughs> and we keep obviously we keep cl clipping back to the house you know and annie is you know well this is where we get our first violent outburst yeah. from her yeah. when she storms in in the middle of the night and she's raging because misery is dead yeah is it Paul's killed her off in his newest book because he wants to, to move on. To move on, but she's already started to read this first manuscript of his, and she's just like, "I, I don't like the profanity. I don't like the swear words." And Paul's just like, "That's how we talk. That's how people from the slums talk." And she's like, "Oh, cocky duty and all that kind of stuff." <laughs> I'm sorry if if you can't say the word fuck and you have to say the word cocky duty, there you got issues. Okay, <laughs> you got issues. But yeah, her storming in. You know, screaming at him. You can't kill my midget. Because we've already heard from her about how this is the only thing that got her through. Her husband leaving her, you know, and that these books have helped her get through. And she felt like this, there was a part of her that connected to misery and Paul. You know, like proper fandom. We've all seen the stalkers and the people that turn up in celebrities' houses and things like that. You know, this is, this is where it all stemmed from, basically. <laughs> You know, and, and she breaks that stool right over the top of oh, his bed. Fuck, yeah. And, you know, and the debris of it just falls down yeah. behind him on top of him. Yeah. And he's just sat there like, holy shit. And, and that's it. That's what I love about James Cann. It's, like I said, this is, a this is a scary motherfucker when he's got the right parts. Yeah. But now he's the one scared. He sells the, the fear. Yeah. Perfectly. And you better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. This is where he starts to obviously formulate the plans of like, I need to get out. Yeah. You know, and like he he finds the hairpin because his door's locked. So he needs something to pick the lock. And I mean, I really felt for Paul when um, she brought in the barbecue. Right. And she's just like, yep, here's your new book. You need to let go of it. You need to destroy it so that you can write a new misery and bring misery back to life. And you can see Paul's face like, uh... No, 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 that's fine. The publicist has got six, six or 12 copies and then people are already reading it. And she details exactly everything to him. She's just like, nope, this is the only copy because that's the only thing that you do. And you always do the same traditional things like you have done because this is the interview that you said 11 years ago of what you do. And that's where my mind went, oh, fuck. She's been living at this house outside Silver Lodge all these years waiting for this moment to yes. get him. That's why you always come back to the Silver Creek Lodge. You told that story to Merv Griffin 11 years ago. Well, not necessarily to get him, but maybe just a chance. Like, I don't think she planned this. No, But then I don't again, know. she was definitely stalking him. Like, I mean, she was on the road, like, when the accident happened. I, I wouldn't be surprised if she threw a bucket of water on the fucking road just to <laughs> yeah, fucking make it more icy, you yeah, know? Yeah, you, you wouldn't put it past <laughs> Annie. wouldn't <laughs> put it past Annie, I mean... No. I don't want to get into Annie's backstory and history yet, but there's a lot more of it in the book than what we're given to in the film. Because yeah. after a little while, I mean, he does manage to break out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he uses that hairpin and he knocks over that ceramic penguin. <laughs> oh, God. When he, when he catches, catches it. it. <laughs> but then he puts it down. And if you're paying attention, it's obvious it's now facing the wrong way. Yeah. Um, that ceramic penguin actually has pops up a few more times in the book as well. Really? Uh, but he goes to the telephone and he finds out that it's been gutted. <laughs> it's <laughs> just a prop. It's like, okay. Cuckoo. 
cuckoo. But he also finds her, her like her journal, like when it's yeah, full of her, newspaper clippings. Her, her, yeah, and photograph it, book. And yeah. it shows that she was like she she um, graduated with high honors from university. She got this high position as a, as a nurse. Oh yeah, but did you notice some of the other clips? Yes, but that's the thing. They that's were right there next to like her achievements was right next there to her husband died mysteriously. Mysteriously. These, these patients in this in this hospital died. These infants have died mysteriously. The, the head doctor that was supposed to be taking Annie's Annie's position mysteriously died. Yes. And it's like it's estimated that at this before we meet her in the film, she's already killed more than 30 people. Oh, yeah. And she's gotten away with it. Yeah. She yeah. always pleads innocence. There's never been enough evidence. And that's because she is incredibly smart and very calculating in her movements. And she's moved from town to town to town to town. The moment she's killed a few people, move into the next town, start it up again. And then it was after her husband w was going to leave her and then mm. she killed him. Yeah. That she moved on to misery and then, of course, then moved to the next town to be close to where he would be writing his books. But yeah, there's there's a lot of just extra detail layers in the background with some of these characters that the first time you watch it, you know, the film is just a great psychological, scary situation you never want to be into. And then when you watch it like the second, third and fourth time, you start to notice all these little things, you know. They, uh, they made up on set, I think, that I mean, Kathy Bates and Rob Reiner, because Kathy really wanted to understand the character more and help her get in the mood, in the mood for it. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they surmised that she was uh, molested by her father at a young age. Yeah. Which is what led her to, you know, in, into some of the violence and some of the, I don't know, like bipolar kind of behavior. Um, I don't know. There, there's lots of different medical terms. Yeah, yeah. Um, for her, you know, her mental instability. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it it's kind of, it's fascinating on a psychological level, but it's also incredibly frightening the way Kathy Bates portrays her character. Yeah. She snaps from being this lovable, adorable, innocent woman to this aggressive, violent monster who still also doesn't swear. Yeah. There's <laughs> there's a like a religious fanaticism behind her as well. Yes. Like you said, you know, we don't hear about it in the film about her family, but, you know, we hear that this is their farm, you know, when the sheriff flies over, you know, so that they're, they're, this family have lived here, you know, and God knows what happened to her parents, you know, had, did she have any siblings? Was she an only she child? She killed her dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No shit, mate. You know, but it's like when you're reading the the, the, the things about the child death, you know, and, and in real life, I, I've read newspaper results of, of nurses who've done this. And my mind questioned, like, how or why did you do this? What was pushing you? Is it the fact that you couldn't have children, you know, and the happiness of others fucking pissed you off? So you wanted to make them as miserable as you, you know, but... That's all, at the same time, that's all side stuff. As amazing and as in-depth as we want to go into it. That's nothing because we're, she is obsessed with Paul, you know. And it's that moment, like he's, he's escaped the first time, come back. And then he's managed to escape the second time. And he's armed himself with a knife. Yeah. He's tried the back door. You know, he's... he's... It's just leading into one of my favourite sequences where he raids the, uh, the the medical cabinet. Yeah. And he takes all of those pills and you watch him in bed, breaking the pills down and putting them in that paper. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he asks Annie to have a dinner date with him. Yeah. A candle-lit dinner. And so while she wanders off to go and find this candle, he spikes the wine. Yes. And yeah. then when she comes back in... She knocks the wine over and you just sat there with with James like, Cann just like, oh no. Like sometimes part of me was like, she knew. She partly oh, oh, knew. I, I, oh, she definitely knew. Yeah. Like there is a shot when he's, when we see the close up shot of him putting the pills in. Yeah. But then when you see the shot like of him in the bed, it's such a low angle that you've got like, I mean, even the bed, like the, the bars look like prison bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that he's imprisoned. But the camera angle is so low. All you would need to do is just put in the uh, the keyhole yeah. over the bed, and that would be the eye level that yeah, she would be watching him from. Watching him she continue. knew what he was doing. She knew, and and this is it. Like she, like like he as well. Amazing about James Can, the, the Paul character, is that there are slight manipulations that he's got. Like he knows, like he's at her mercy, like she, at her will. But at the same time, little things like that, like come and have dinner with me, Annie. And she's like, oh, I'm so excited. And he's like, I've got you in position now. Yeah. You know, the same thing with the paper where he's just like, I can't use this paper. And she gets so angry at him. But like, he knows, like, I can get her out of the house. 
for another for, 10 minutes. For yeah. another 10 minutes if she has to go and get this paper and I can use this as an excuse. And uh, like, I, I love that little moment as well where like it's raining and she comes into the room and she just chucks him his pills and she goes to walk off. And he's like, and you, it's a real change of her character. Even, you know, you've had the angry side of her and the happy-go-lucky side of her. Now we've just got depressed Annie. Yeah. You know? That's, again, a side effect of her, her mental condition where she's suicidal. That's it. She's just like, the rain brings me the blues and I've got this gun. And sometimes I think about, you know, killing myself. And then she just wanders off out into the rain. And Paul's got himself this knife. You know, and he's practicing. He's practicing in bed. <laughs> Rambo mode. Rambo mode. Yeah, I fucking got it down. I'm gonna fucking yeah. He's got he's, and he's got this plan, and then he falls asleep, and Annie comes in and just jams him in the arm with a fucking sedative. <laughs> that shot where she's just there and a yeah. flash of lightning. Oh <laughs> man, jabs him in the arm, and she's like, "I know you've been getting out of bed. My ceramic uh, penguin was facing the wrong way. Yeah, and uh, you're staying here until you finish this book, and just to make sure you do it." Oh yeah, I'm gonna hobble you. And she recounts this story. I mean, they're, they're in a mining town, and so she talks about how miners uh, that they would steal the diamonds, they would hobble them, yeah, so that they could continue to work. work. And you watch her place that two by four between his ankles. She picks up that sledgehammer, Triple H, <laughs> and it's completely different from the book. <laughs> yeah, and they argued. They had arguments, and they 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 wondered what to do on set. And they thought it would be too much yeah, to I... do to take an axe and cut off his foot. Yeah. And so they went with what they did. And you only see one ankle get broken. Please. Yeah. But when she swings it and you hear that snap. Just one more. <laughs> and James can screaming as Annie moves to the other side of the bed and swings again. Yeah. You're just like that. It, it, it's one of the most horrific moments in film for me. Like once you've seen it, you'll never forget it. It was for me as well when I was when I was young and I watched this. I think this was a point where a lot of women in the world watched Misery and went, "Hmm." <laughs> like you said, unless you've read the book, you know you don't know what's coming. And then the way she'll just appear. You know, in the room with him. You know, you didn't even hear the door. You didn't even see her come in. Yeah. And just whack. And I, the crunch, <laughs> the, the, the bones. Break. I can't even think about it without fucking wincing. And like I said, I've seen enough blood, guts and gore to last me a lifetime. But when you film something really well, you don't need to see it. You know, you just need the actor to express and the noise to follow through. And you'll never forget that scene for the rest of your life. Right. Like, I, like a lot of the time I forget about the little details of Misery. Like I said, the sheriff's still rushing around. They found the car. They know Paul is, must be somewhere because somebody's crowbarred the door open. You know, you've still got the publicist trying to find out where he is because she's not worried about the book. She's worried about her client, you know, yeah. their friends. I love the Buster's like he's tried everywhere to find clues or evidence as to where Paul must have gone. Yeah. And uh, he decides like, well, I've, I'm out of ideas. So he goes and buys like every misery book yeah. and he starts reading them <laughs> yeah, through yeah. until he reads a quote. Do you read Sutter Kane? <laughs> that wasn't the quote. But, <laughs> but then he, he matches it to a newspaper clipping. Yes. And Annie had said the exact same thing in her court hearing. Yes. And so he was like, I'm just going to drop in my car and drive right down to the old Wilkes farm area. Well, he stops in the store though, doesn't he? At and first. asks about the... And asks the store. And the store clerk's going, oh, well, anything weird? Uh, typing paper. You know, that, if that's weird. And you bust his face is like... Why would she need this? Yeah, and then jumps in the car and drives down there. And this is the only part of misery that I really kind of don't like um, out of the whole of the film. Because, like, I really like the Buster character, the, the actor playing Buster. And he comes in and he has this back and forth with Annie about, you know, Paul Sheldon, how he's gone missing. And she knows everything. Everything. I love that moment when he's in the hallway and he peeks around the corner and she peeks back around the yeah. corner and they both just kind of laugh. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh. Yes. Because you're a sheriff. I mean, you must have suspicions about this person who's been involved in a lot oh, of yeah. different murders and now all of a sudden this guy's gone missing and she's close connected. But it's, it's that, but like she has, man, 
Annie has managed to subdue Paul again and thrown him in the basement. And it's a, like a secret hidden fucking door. You know, and so the sheriff's not even made aware of anything, but he knows that something's up because, oh, I've turned my guest bedroom into a room where I can type and I can act like Paul Sheldon because God has told me that now he's gone, I'm the new Paul. And it's like, <laughs> you're mental. Um, but Buster walks out the house and Paul pulls the barbecue over and smashes it onto the floor. And he rushes back in and confronts Paul in the basement and then gets shot in the back by Annie. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Sheldon? You see his chest explode outwards and you're just like, man, that sucks. That really sucks because the film has built up the, this character and the relationship he has with his wife. But then after this, nothing more is said. Yeah. Like we don't ever see the reaction from his wife. I can only assume that she's fucking heartbroken and, and upset. You know, and it's just, it's it's a moment in the movie for me where I'm like, oh! Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of the high points of the film, though, just to bring you so low again and yeah. just cement how incredibly hopeless it is for this character who's yeah. now, you know, his one chance of hope or being rescued is, is just died right in front of him. Yeah. And it also just, again, it also just shows you how psychotic and crazy Annie is. Yeah, yeah, which we, we already realised yeah. by this point. But Paul has come up with this great idea. And well, he's finished the book for her now. That's it. He, he's managed to grab some lighter fluid from the basement. I mean, she leaves the wheelchair at the top of the stairs and expects him to climb the right. way up to do it. <laughs> and then he goes into the room and he's finishing off the book. And Annie's reading each chapter. And I love the fact that when you're watching the typewriter, she tells you that she bought the typewriter cheap because it has no end. Yes. And then he's writing, and if you're reading it, you can just see where There's all no the ends are yeah. missing and all that kind of stuff. But he's writing and he's typing, and they're coming up with these great ideas about how misery has come back to life. And you, partially, I can see from Paul's face that he's like, "This is stupid. None of nobody's going to believe half of the stuff I've written. I'm just writing it for you." But Annie's so excited and so happy that she has all everything now perfect. And he says to her, "Like, you need to go and get me." Uh, a glass of champagne and, and a match and a cigarette because I've got the final chapter. I'm going to finish it. And she's like, oh, my God, OK. And she rushes off. And then he says, oh, we need two glasses. And she's like, oh, I'm so excited. And like I said, it's that whole manipulation again of, no, Annie, I need you out of the room for a couple more minutes. And he, he gets her out of the way and he, he throws the finished book on the floor and he gets the last page and he covers it in lighter fluid. And she hands him, you know, she, she comes back into the room and he's got the match and he's, I love it. He's just like, all the information you wanted about Misery's dad, it's in here. The person that she falls in love with, it's all in here. And he just lights the match, lights the page and just <laughs> Remember how for all those years, nobody knew who Misery's real father was? Or if they'd ever be reunited? It's all right here. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And that's it. Annie is broken. She's like, what? No. And she jumps down. He's like, I learned it from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Picks up the typewriter and smashes it over her head. It's like, yes. <laughs> it's an absolute great fight sequence. Again, it was another thing where, where Kathy was like, I want to rehearse this. I want to rehearse this. And James Cameron was just like, no rehearsals at all. No. We just do it and we do it right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it is, it, it's violent and it's believable. You know, they start yes. throwing each other around, eye gouging, punching, throwing, yeah, yeah. hair pulling. Yeah. It's, but, it's real. It, that's it. That's it. It's so real to show that, like, like, it doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, or whatever, you know, like... You're fighting for your life. Yeah, if you're fighting for your life, you will fight you will bite scuffle. And, yeah. yeah, you know, and if you're psychotically unhinged, you will do everything to keep your perfect little world going. And so she doesn't want... Like, I feel like she doesn't want to kill Paul at this stage. She just... She's planning on... You know, like, she's already said, like, We're, I'm going to kill you before the police come. You know, so Paul's got this last moment to do this book. But she, like, if she'd had a chance, she'd have probably tied him up in the bed again. Yeah. You know, and given herself a couple more minutes before killing herself. But at this point, she's having to fight, and they are fighting. Eat it to yourself, you sick, twisted fuck! <laughs> 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 
that moment when he trips her up and her head just oh. bangs off the typewriter. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh, I was like, how did they do that? Was that a, was that a dummy? Like, was was the that typewriter made out of rubber? Because it felt horrible. And it's the clunk as well. Yeah, exactly. And you believe that she's out because, like, we get the overhead the blood shot, puddle. The blood puddle, and if you play enough video games, that blood puddle usually tells you they're dead. <laughs> You know, but Paul is crawling out of the room and then she lunges on him at the last moment and you're like, fuck, it's Carrie all over again. She's still alive. <laughs> I love the fact that he has to reach out for Misery. The pig. The pig ornament, because of course, Kathy's pig is named Misery. So it's literally Misery that saves him. Yeah. <laughs> and he just clocks her right in the fucking head. Yeah. You know, thunk. And part of me, even though, even though I've watched this film a million times, I'm still sat there like, she's going to get up. Right, yeah. You know? <laughs> no, she definitely she's dead. She's definitely dead. But it's in the back of your mind. And it's also in the back of his mind. Because months, years later, yeah. he's still having that post-traumatic stress disorder where he's seeing Annie oh, God. in place of others when yeah. she's not really there. But it's a really awesome and poignant moment at the end when he sat with his publicist and he's like, I wasn't able to write this book. Until the things that happened to me. Yeah. Annie has changed me. Yeah. She's made me realize about my fandom, about who I am, and about yeah. what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and the publicists are like, oh, you need to write a book about everything that just happened to you. Yeah. So that we can make some money. Yeah. And he's just like, you're telling me we should make money on one of the most traumatic experiences of my life? And then you see her walking down, didn't you? And yeah, you're like, with a knife. <laughs> oh, fuck, she's still alive. And it's the way James Cann is still talking about, like, how he still sees her. She's in the back of his head. He's still having nightmares. And then the woman, cha Kathy Bates, changes to a normal woman. And she just looks at him and goes, Are you Paul Sheldon? I'm your number one fan. And he goes, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't mean to bother you, but are you Paul Sheldon? Yes. I just want to tell you I'm your number one fan. Man, what a film. What a film. <laughs> Ian, favourite moments. Oh, man. I like, like, personally for me, like, the whole film is, like, one really good fucking trip. There's just a, a, a few sequences that really just make it stand out. The looking at the legs, you know, when he's had this crash for the first time, you know, and she reveals it. And the, the special effects are amazing, you know, swollen, fucking bruised. You know, I, like I said, I feel it and I feel the confinement that James Caan is in at this point because he emotes it to me to say, like, I, I, I can feel the pain and I don't want to feel the pain. I don't even want to fucking look at it. Virginia, while we're in this car, you're my deputy, not my <laughs> wife. It's just, it's just such a weird, like, Stephen King stories, people, you know, they... they you know you're watching a dark Stephen King movie and then somebody drops a line like that in that just brings the comedy element in. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, I'll stay for 10 more minutes even though I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Annie coming in and upset at um, Paul for killing Misery. You know, every time that Kathy Bates went into angry mode, I got scared. I, I mean, I was even, I was already scared anyway when she was happy, you yeah. lucky, you know. Because you don't know when the violence is going to come. That's it. But it's the little moments, like with the soup, you know, when she's feeding him and she's spilling soup all over the bed, you know, or when she's getting the barbecue out and she's talking to him and she's just walking past the bed, flicking lighter fluid onto the bed like she hasn't got a care, you know, and, and, and the film brilliantly builds up all of these crazy situations to the point that when she does finally snap you're like we need to get the fuck <laughs> out um and and yeah just like i said the leg situation with the the, the piece of wood yeah you know i i've already said this but i always forget the little things in this movie the conversational pieces you know the actors exactly what everybody goes through but i will never ever forget that piece of wood and that sledgehammer right <laughs> Yeah, there are so many highlights in the film. I think my first favourite scene is the, the, the first sequence where he uh, gets out of bed and collapses and hits the oh, floor. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's screaming in pain, but he yeah. gets he gets out of the door. And for me, it's like, it's the first time you get to see the rest of the house. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's such a tense moment, especially when he hears her coming back. And he's desperately trying to get back into his room and lock the door and get back into bed and be like, uh, uh. <laughs> she's like, oh, you're all sweating. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, of course, uh, I'm in pain. I'm like, no, you've been... <laughs> You know, um, I think uh, one of my other favourite sequences is the uh, the cock a doody cock. 
he didn't get out of the cockadoo de car. <laughs> Just a great moment when she's recapping about you know those old uh, like black and white yeah. pre pre movie clips yeah. um, that would always have those cliffhangers, and when she just rages about them, I was like that that was great. And like you said, it harkens into even as a kid, she was smart, yes, and outwardly thinking all of these things, you know, and wanted to make a scene. And yeah, yeah. Um, of course, I love the uh, the candlelit dinner sequence, just mm-hmm. like the plan coming to fruition, and then just. Over in an instant. Yeah. And of course, the sledgehammer to the ankles. Just brutal, traumatic. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Ian, do you recommend Misery? Yes, I do. And like I said at the start, I find it really hard not to recommend a lot of Stephen King adaptations into movies. You know, some of them, yeah, some, some people might go, oh, that's not very good and that's not very good. Misery... I'd like to meet that one person who doesn't like Misery. I'd like to ask them why, you know, what is the film missing? Because it's got everything. It's got tense situations. It's got fucking actors emoting their goddamn asses off. You know, it's got backstory into the the life of Stephen King. Like I said, the only part I ever don't like is when Buster gets killed. Because after the end, it's not brought up again. You know, it's such a massive moment and yet we just carry on. But then again, saying that, looking into all the stuff with Annie and the, the child killings that she did, all the backstory of her husband and her and her, and and her parents and all that kind of stuff. That stuff you want to know, but it's not there. Annie and Paul, James Cannon and Kathy Bates in this room acting their fucking asses off. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> An absolute easy recommendation for me. It's a great thriller and one of the best with exceptional performances from Kathy Bates and James Can. It's gripping from start to finish and holds up on multiple viewings. The film moves at a great pace with excellent direction by Rob Reiner with a constant state of dread and rising tension as the levels of insanity are slowly revealed. It really captures that isolated hopelessness and desperation through not only the acting, but the great cinematography by Barry Sonnenfeld. You really feel trapped and imprisoned and at the mercy of Annie Wilkes. There's a lot of good Stephen King adaptations, and this is a great one. It's a must-watch for cinema and film fans with scenes so well done, you will always remember it. And misery Loves company. (laughs) Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. I'll be looking at the moon But I'll be seeing you I put two bullets in my gun. One for you and one for me. Oh, darling, it'll be so beautiful. 